Behind me here is the uh, CDC 6500, which is uh, a member of the first supercomputer family. They invented the term supercomputer for the 6600 because it was about 10 times faster than any other computer on the market. This machine was 22 years old when it came out of service. And all these cables that you can see here were cut. And so the first thing we had to do was uh, get new cables for the machine. Now the cable was manufactured by three different companies and none of them would make us a cable of the ones that were still in business. So uh, we had to go searching. One of the things we needed for the cables was the taper pins that go on the end. They were manufactured by AMP. AMP said they would uh, give them to us in gold, they would give them to us in tin, but they no longer had any that were silver, which is what this machine used, probably because it conducted better. So we talked to them, and we talked to them, and eventually they said, all right, well, if you buy 60,000 pins for a dollar a piece, we'll make some for you. And we said, okay, and they kind of were startled, and a few weeks later they came back and said, gee, we don't have enough material to make 60,000 pins, we're sorry, but if you take 50,000 pins at 75 cents a piece, we can do that. And we said, okay. So I have 40,000 pins sitting upstairs on the shelf because I only needed 10,000 to put the machine together. That was $60,000, and then we spent another $60,000 to actually make the cables with the pins on the ends. And then uh, it took about five weeks for my technician to replace all the, the uh, cut ends with the new cables, which is really kind of amazing, because he only made two mistakes in that whole process. So this is the first machine that was uh, cooled with Freon, you might be able to hear a little humming in the background in amongst all the noise that the rest of the computers make. It's kind of a sound. And that's the compressors uh, for the refrigeration system that cools it. So here's our refrigeration system. Each one of the three bays has one of these refrigeration systems in it. And we run Freon that goes between each row of modules here. And I don't know if you can see it, but right here, there's a uh, copper tube that the, that the Freon actually runs between here. And so that's Freon gas. We compress it into a liquid with the compressor here. The liquid goes through this heat exchanger to uh, uh, move the heat into water. The water goes up to a uh, water chiller on the roof another $185,000 just to install that guy. And then he runs it through hoses. And you can see these hoses here going into each of the 12 chassis. And this is one of our uh, eight memory chassis. Each one of these little blocks is 4K words by 12 bits. And for the main CPU, there's five blocks to make the 60-bit word of the computer. So this chassis holds 16K words, and we've got eight of those for a total of uh, 64K words. Uh, actually, there's 128K words in the whole machine, but I only have half of it working. Uh, these modules here are the most problematic part of the machine, and I've got about uh, oh, 20 of them that don't work so far. Now over here, all of these little dots are uh, modules that I pulled out of the first central processor because uh, they didn't work and I stole them from this guy so I would have at least one processor to work. But, uh, as of yesterday, I have managed to actually build a replacement for one of these modules. This guy right here, the ED module, I can show you that guy. doesn't work 
and it requires all of the memory bandwidth to itself. And so I didn't like that. And so most of the time it was not unplugged or not plugged in. But here you can see on the edge, these little silver cans are all individual transistors. So your phone has about a billion transistors in it. This whole machine has about 250,000 or so. And if the transistor is on the edge, I can change it because amazingly enough, I can still get the transistor. The package is a shortened version of the TO18, and I can get the standard part uh, just off the shelf at DigiKey these days. So the new module I've replaced uses the surface mount version, which I can also get, and I put the transistors on the outside when I did it so I can change them should I have to fix that module. But it was really a nightmare putting them back together because uh, you have to put all the resistors and diodes in on one side, and then you try to slide them across and get them into the right hole on the other side. And it's a rather tedious process, but it works. So that's what they did then. So here's one of the core modules. There's 12 of these core mats inside here, stacked in like this. Here's the core mat. There's 4,096 bits there, and uh, each thing that looks like it might be a circle is actually four cores on edge, and each core has five wires going through it. And they're all supported by the wires that go through there. When we got this machine, we got three peripherals. We got a card punch, but no controller, which is a much bigger box than the card punch. We got a printer, but no controller, which is the same size as the printer. And we got a tape drive, but no controller. So in order to bring the machine up, if we walk around here, I had to uh, design emulations for most of the peripherals here. And that's what I've got in this rack here. Each of these silver guys is talking to one channel from the CPU. And so the first thing I had to do was emulate the dead start panel, which was, we would call it flash or read-only memory these days, but it gave me 12 instructions to boot the machine with. And that wasn't much to run diagnostics out of. And so I emulated that so I can put in a 4,000 word program, which is as much as our peripheral processor can hold. And that allowed me to do a lot of diagnostics. Uh, then the next thing we had to do was the display, uh, because our real display, A, the one for this machine, doesn't work yet after two years, and uh, B, they're very fragile. We left the one we have on over the weekend one time, and a transformer blew up, and it took uh, about four months and $15,000 to get a new transformer built. After we got the display, then we had to emulate the tape drive, and then we emulated uh, card reader and card punch, and then line printer, and all those things are running now. Uh, right now over here, uh, we have the machine running if you let me find the right window here. So this window down here is actually the dead start panel control. Then we have this green one is the tape drive. You can see over here it says tape 13, and that's as it was moving up. The blue one is the disk drives. This red one here is card reader, card punch, and line printer. And these are the two console Replacement These are all the separate uh, control points, they call them, but they're separate processes that can be run. Right. And up here we've got the display of what the channels are doing, and down here what each of the peripheral processes are doing. Right now there isn't much going on, but if we uh, fire up a longer process, this is actually the WinPack program. You can see up here we've got a couple of processes going to do that. Uh, this compilation takes about six seconds, and we'll see that over here in a second. 
and then it takes 45 seconds for it to run or so. It was a privilege to talk to Bruce and explore the history of the CDC 6500 restoration. I use punch cards to run Fortran programs on a CDC 6500 at Michigan State University in the late 1970s. By the mid-1980s, I was a professional developer supporting faculty use of the CDC 6500. I spent plenty of hours sitting at that green glowing CDC 6500 console as an operator mounting tapes or debugging system issues. For me, spending time with Bruce in the CDC 6500 was like a 40-year class reunion. Thank you.